Welcome to the Daily Current Affairs by Civic Center IAS, where we try to discuss the important articles from the Hindu, the Indian Express, and the PIB from the UPSC CSC prelims perspective. Displayed are the list of articles which we are going to talk about in today's video. The first article says that the Central Bureau of Investigation on Sunday completed a polygraph tests on seven people in connection with the rape and murder of a resident doctor at Arjikar Medical College and Hospital in Kolkata. In this context, let us talk about CBI. See, the Central Bureau of Investigation, in short called the CBI, is the premier investigating police agency in India, which is functioning under the Department of Personal, under the Ministry of Personal, Pension and Public Grievances of Government of India. Also, it is an allied force playing a major role in the preservation of values in public life and in ensuring the health of national economy. Further, it is also the nodal police agency in India which coordinates investigation on behalf of Interpol member countries. Notably, it was set up in the year 1963 by a resolution of the Ministry of Home Affairs, but later it was transferred to the Ministry of Personal. Know that its establishment was recommended by the Santanam Committee on the Prevention of Corruption during the years 1962 to 1964. Significantly, the CBI is neither a constitutional body nor a statutory body. See, it derives its powers from the Delhi Special Police Establishment Act of 1946. Further, it also provides assistance to the Central Vigilance Commission and Lokpal. Now, if we have to talk about the functions of CBI, firstly, investigating the cases of corruption, bribery and misconduct of central government employees. Secondly, investigating the cases related to infringement of physical and economic laws, that is, the breach of laws concerning export and import control, customs and central, ex central excise, income tax, foreign exchange regulations and so on. Know that these cases are taken up either in consultation with or at the request of the department concerned. Then also investigating the serious crimes having national and international ramifications committed by organized gangs of professional uh, criminals. Next coordinating the activities of the anti-corruption agencies and the various state police forces. Further, taking up on the request of a state government any case of public uh, importance of her investigation. Then, maintaining crime statistics and disseminating the criminal information. Significantly, it is a multidisciplinary investigation agency of the government of India and undertakes investigation of corruption-related cases, economic offences and cases of conventional crime. The next article is in the context of our Prime Minister reiterating his call for a secular civil court and saying that though his government had become vocal on the issue for the first time, the judiciary in the country had been advocating it for several decades. Further, he praised the judiciary for fulfilling its moral responsibility of being vigilant and active on national issues. In this context, let us talk about the Uniform Civil Code. See, the Uniform Civil Code is a proposed set of laws uh, intended to replace the diverse personal laws governing various communities in the country with a single set of laws uh, applicable to all citizens, irrespective of their religion. Significantly, the Code uh, comes under the Article 44 of the Constitution, which uh, lays down uh, the state uh, shall endeavour to secure a uniform civil code for the citizens throughout the territory of India. So, it makes the part of the directive principles of state policy. But we all know that the principles are not uh, legally enforceable. They are meant to guide the state uh, in making the policies. Further, it has been supported by some as a way to promote uh, national integration and gender justice, but opposed by others as a threat to religious freedom and diversity. Notably, the idea of UCC is to promote uh, equality and non-discrimination by ensuring that all the citizens are governed by the same set of laws in matters such as marriage, divorce, inheritance and adoption. See, the only state in India that had a UCC is Goa, which retained its common family law known as the Goa Civil Code after it was liberated from Portuguese rule in 1961. So the rest of India follows different personal laws based on their community or the religious identity. But recently, Uttarakhand has passed the Uttarakhand Uniform Civil Code Bill of 2024, becoming the first state in India to implement a uniform civil code. The next article says that special centres were set up for the promotion of Telugu, 
Kannada, Malayalam and Odia after they were designated uh, classical languages are demanding autonomy in their functioning in order to better carry out their functions. In this context, let us talk about classical languages of India. See, currently there are six languages that enjoy classical status in India, which are Tamil declared in 2004, Sanskrit declared in 2005, Kannada in 2008, Telugu in 2008, Malayalam in 2013 and Odia in 2014. Know that all the classical languages are listed in the 8th schedule of the Indian constitution. Significantly, the Ministry of Culture provides guidelines regarding the classical languages. Now, moving on to look at the guidelines for declaring a language as classical, which are Firstly, high antiquity of its early texts or recorded history over a period of 1500 to 2000 years. Secondly, a body of ancient literature or texts which is considered a valuable heritage by generations of speakers. Thirdly, the literary tradition be original and not borrowed from another speech community. Since the classical language and literature being distinct from the modern ones, there may also be a discontinuity between the classical language and its later forms or its offshoots. Further, know that once a language is notified as a classical language, the Human Resource and Development Ministry provides certain benefits to promote it. The next article says that Philippines and China clashed in disputed waters of the South China Sea on over what Manila said was a resupply mission for fishermen, according to the latest in a series of sea and air confrontations in the strategic waterway. In this context, let us talk about South China Sea. See, the South China Sea is a critical and strategically significant body of water located in the Western Pacific Ocean, bordering the Southeast Asian mainland. Know that it is south of China, east and south of Vietnam, west of Philippines, and north of the island of Borneo. Now, if you, if you have to talk about its geographical boundaries, the northern boundary stretches from the northernmost point of Taiwan to the coast of Fujian province of China in the Taiwan Strait. Whereas the southern boundary is defined by a rise in the seabed between the islands of Sumatra and Borneo. Significantly, the sea is bordered by China, Taiwan, the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei and Vietnam. Now, it is connected to other seas also through the following straits, which are firstly the Taiwan Strait, which connects the South China Sea to the East China Sea, and then the Luzon Strait that links it to the Philippine Sea, and the Magellan Sea of the Pacific Ocean. So together, the South China Sea and the East China Sea are referred to as China Seas. Now, if we have to talk about the archipelagos, see, we have parcel islands that are controlled by China, and this group of islands is one of the major archipelagos in the South China Sea. Next, we have Spratly Islands, which is another significant archipelago and is subject to territorial disputes involving multiple countries in the region. Some of the major ports are Hong Kong, Singapore and Kaohsiung. It has a lot of significance too. See, it is the second most used sea lane in the world. Further, it is a significant trade route for crude oil from the Persian Gulf and Africa through the state of Malacca to Singapore, Thailand, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea and Japan. The next article says that the Border Roads Organization has told the Uttarakhand Forest Department and an environmental ministry panel that the Chardam Road project on the Gangotri Darasu route does not require either environment impact assessment study or even the environmental clearance. In this context, let us talk about the aspects related to it. Firstly, if we talk about the Border Roads Organization, see it is a road construction executive force in India that provides a support to Indian Armed Forces. Know that it was formed on 7th May of 1960 to secure India's borders and develop infrastructure in remote areas of the north and northeast states of the country. Further, to ensure coordination and uh, expeditious execution of the projects, the Government of India set up the Border Roads Development Board uh, with the Prime Minister as the Chairman of the Board and Def Defence Minister as the Deputy Chairman. Also, it develops and maintains road networks in India border areas and uh, friendly neighbouring countries. Significantly, this includes uh, infrastructure operations in 19 states uh, and three union territories, which includes Andaman and Nicobar Islands, and neighboring countries such as Afghanistan, Bhutan, Myanmar, Tajikistan, and Sri Lanka. Notably, the Gangotri Darasu route falls in the Bhagirathi eco sensitive zone. In this context, we will move on to talk about the eco sensitive zones. See the National Environmental Policy of 2006 
defined uh, eco sensitive zones as those areas or zones which uh, identified uh, environmental resources have uh, incomparable values uh, which require special attention for their conservation because of its landscape wildlife biodiversity historical and natural values furthermore the national wildlife action plan of 2002 to 2016 of the ministry of environment forest and climate change stipulated that state government should declare the land uh, falling within the 10 kilometers of the boundaries of the national parks and wildlife sanctuaries as eco fragile zones or eco sensitive zones under the environmental protection act of 1986 while the 10 km rule is implemented as a general principle the extent of its applications can vary so areas beyond the 10 km can be also be notified by the union government as the eco sensitive zone if they hold a larger ecologically important sensitive corridors now let us see the what are the activities allowed in the eco sensitive zones so firstly talking about the prohibited activities commercial mining sawmills industries causing pollution establishment of major hydroelectric products commercial of use of wood all these are prohibited additionally tourism activities like hot air balloons over the national park discharge of effluents or any solid waste or production of hazardous substances are also prohibited then we have regulated activities which are felling of trees establishment of hotels and resorts commercial use of natural water erection of electrical cables drastic change of agriculture system example adoption of heavy technologies pesticides etc and then widening of roads all these activities are regulated lastly talking about the permitted activities which are uh, ongoing agriculture or horticulture practices rainwater harvesting organic farming use of uh, renewable energy resources adoption of green technology for all activities the next article says that the union minister bupendra yadav announced uh, three new ramsar sites in tamil nadu and madhya pradesh earlier this month taking the total of such sites in india to 85 so the new additions are the nanjarayan uh, bird sanctuary and kazubeli bird sanctuary in tamil nadu and uh, tawa reservoir in madhya pradesh in this context let us talk about the related aspects see the ramsar sites are also known as wetlands of international importance notably it was the ramsar convention which led to their establishment has been a landmark in raising awareness around this key ecosystem now what are wetlands see according to the convention wetlands are defined as areas of marsh fen peatland or water whether natural or artificial permanent or temporary with water that is static or flowing fresh brackish or salt including the areas of marine water the depth of which at low tide does not exceed 6 meters further this definition includes all lakes rivers underground aquifers swamps marshes and then other major water bodies then what are ramsar sites see the ramsar convention is an intergovernmental treaty signed in the year 1971 in ramsar of iran significantly it encourages the protection and conservation of wetlands worldwide by designating them as such know that india joined it in the year 1982 initially designating the chilka lake in odisha and kiyoladoyo national park in rajasthan notably the sundarbans is one of the most renewed wetlands in india further even the cold desert ecosystems also have wetlands like somoriri and uh, Pang pangsong so lake in ladakh which include rare and endangered species uh, such as black neck crane now let us talk about the new ramsar sites which were added firstly nanjarayan bird sanctuary in tamil nadu which is located on the banks of river noyal originally a water reservoir for irrigation use it has since uh, become a significant ecosystem supporting a very range of avifauna know that it is home to species like eurasian coot spot billed duck and many types of herons uh, the wetland also serves some uh, major migratory birds flying along the central asian highway establishing itself as a biodiversity hotspot secondly the kazubeli sanctuary on the koromandal coast which is one of the largest brackish water wetlands uh, in the south india significantly the ecosystems mix of salt marshes mud flats and shallow waters uh, make it a home to many globally endangered species uh, like the black headed ibis and greater flamingo further it is also a stopover for migratory birds along the east asian australian flyway also in storing water kazuveli also helps with the flood control and groundwater recharge helping maintain the region's water table 
Lastly, the Tawar Reservoir in Madhya Pradesh is also integral in the regional water management. It is created by damming the Tawar River, which is the reservoir, became a massive wintering ground for migratory birds. Further, Tawar provides irrigation water to farmlands, drinking water to local communities, and sustains nearby fisheries. The next article is related to foreign portfolio investments. In this context, let us talk about it. See, FBI refers to the purchase and holding of a wide array of foreign financial assets by investors seeking to invest in a country outside their own. Some of the examples of FBIs include stocks, bonds, mutual funds, exchange traded funds, American depository receipts and global depository receipts. Know that FBI is a part of country's capital account and is shown on the balance of payments. See, FBI generally intends to invest money into the foreign country's stock market to generate a quick return. Remember that in India, foreign portfolio investment is regulated by the Securities and Exchange Board of India. Further, FBI in India refers to the investment groups of the foreign institutional investors and the qualified foreign investors. Now, what drives the flow of FBI into a country? See the factors such as economic stability, growth prospects, favorable regulatory environments and attractive returns draw FBI into a country. But there are also risks associated with FBI too. These risks include currency fluctuations, political instability, different regulatory environments and economic volatility in the foreign market. Interestingly, FBI is often referred to as hot money because of its tendency to flee at the signs of uh, first signs of trouble in an economy. Hence, FBI is more liquid, volatile and therefore riskier than the FDI. The next article says that the union cabinet cleared the unified pension scheme for the union government employees. So with this, the government hopes to pull out at least one plank of the opposition, especially of the Congress, which had promised to implement a old pension scheme uh, which promises a fixed amount of pension that is not dependent uh, on market forces. In this context, let us talk about the Unified Pension Scheme. See, the Union Cabinet, led by the Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi, had approved the Unified Pension Scheme, which introduces several key benefits for the employees. Now, let us look at the salient features of the scheme. Firstly, the employees will receive a pension amounting to 50% of their average basic pay drawn over the last 12 months prior to retirement. Know that this applies to those with at least 25 years of service. But for those with less than 25 years of the service, the pension will be proportionately adjusted with a minimum qualifying service of 10 years. Secondly, in the unfortunate event of a family's demise, their family will receive a family pension at 60% of the pension that the employee was receiving and or was eligible to receive before their passing. Thirdly, employees will be guaranteed a minimum pension of 10,000 rupees per month upon retirement, provided they have completed at least 10 years of service. Further, the assured pension family pension and minimum pension will be adjusted for inflation. Notably, the dearness relief will be based on the All India Consumer Price Index for the industrial workers, similar to the adjustments made for the service employees. Lastly, upon retirement, employees will receive a lump sum payment in addition to their gratuity. So this payment will be calculated as one tenth of their monthly emoluments as the date of the superannuation for every completed six months of service. But importantly, this lump sum payment will not reduce the amount of assured pension. Significantly, this scheme provides a robust post-retirement financial security to employees and their families, ensuring a stable income adjusted for inflation alongside additional benefits at the time of retirement. The next article says that the Uni Cabinet, chaired by Sri Narendra Modi, today approved a continuation of three umbrella schemes merged into a unified central sector scheme which is named as Vigyandara of the Department of Science and Technology. Notably, the three schemes which were merged are Science and Technology, Institutional and Human Capacity Building, Research and Development, and lastly, Innovation, Technology Development and Deployment. Know that it was aiming to improve the efficiency and synchronization in the fund utilization. Now, if we have to look at the objectives of the mission, firstly, to strengthen the STI ecosystem in India, Secondly, to establish well-equipped R&D labs in academic institutions. Thirdly, to promote gender parity in the S&T field. And lastly, to enhance collaboration between different sectors to drive innovation. Now, let us talk about the key components of the Vigyan Dara scheme. 
See, the first component is science and technology, institution and human capacity building. Under this, firstly, the scheme promotes development of uh, S&T infrastructure. Secondly, it focuses uh, on building a human critical resource pool to strengthen the science and technology landscape. Thirdly, it aims to improve the full-time equivalent uh, researcher count. And lastly, includes uh, interventions to increase women's participation in S&T, promoting gender parity. The second component is research and development. Under this, uh, it supports the basic research and access to international mega facilities. Then the scheme uh, encourages translational research in areas like uh, sustainable energy and water. Thirdly, it facilitates uh, collaborative research uh, through international bilateral and multilateral cooperation. Then the third component is innovation, technology development and deployment. Under this, the scheme uh, promotes uh, innovations at all levels from school education to higher education and for industries and startups. And further, it enhances the collaboration between academia, government and industries. Now, looking at the financial and strategic aspects related to it, see the proposed outlay for the scheme is 10,579.84 crores during the 15th Finance Commission period. Significantly, the scheme aligns with the Department of Science and Technology's five-year goals and contributes to the vision of the Vixit Bharat of 2047. Further, the R&D component will be coordinated with the Anusandan Natural Research Foundation. Interestingly, the implementation will adhere to the global standards while aligning with the national priorities. The last article of the day says that the Union Cabinet chaired by Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi approved the bio e 3 which stands for Biotechnology for Economy, Environment and Employment Policy for fostering high-performance biomanufacturing of the Department of Biotechnology. In this context, let us talk about the aspects related to it. See the bio e 3 policy for fostering the high-performance biomanufacturing in short, uh, called the bio e 3 policy, is a forward-looking initiative designed to bolster innovation, research and entrepreneurship in the field of biotechnology in India. Now, if you look at the objectives of the mission, see the bio e 3 policy is intended to foster a sustainable and circular economy through the industrialization of biology. Further, it aims to advance uh, cutting-edge innovations in biotechnology, contributing to the creation of a high-performance biomanufacturing ecosystem in India. Notably, the policy aligns with the global and national priorities, promoting a future that is responsive to critical societal and environmental challenges. Now, if we discuss the key features of the bio e 3 policy, firstly, the policy focuses on supporting research and development and entrepreneurship across various thematic sectors. Further, it aims to accelerate technology development and commercialization by establishing biomanufacturing and bio-AI hubs and biofoundry. Secondly, the scheme prioritizes regenerative bioeconomy models that contribute to green growth. Also, it supports the government initiatives like the net zero carbon economy and lifestyle for environment. Additionally, it aims to promote a circular bioeconomy which emphasizes uh, sustainable and circular practices under the scheme. Thirdly, it facilitates uh, expansion of India's skilled workforce. Further, it anticipates a surge in job creation, particularly in the biotechnology and related sectors. Now, what are the strategic or thematic sectors under the scheme? See, the policy will focus on several strategic sectors to address the national priorities, which are, firstly, high-value bio-based chemicals, biopolymers and enzymes, then smart proteins and functional foods, thirdly, precision biotherapeutics, next, uh, climate-resilient agriculture, also carbon capture and utilization, and lastly, marine and space research. So these are the key components uh, or these are the strategic or the key sectors uh, under the scheme. So we have discussed 10 articles in total for today from the Hindu, the Indian Express and the PIB from the UPSC CSA prelims perspective. We'll be back again tomorrow with another video. Thank you.